The second part of this evening's program um, gives us the opportunity, gives the British Academy the opportunity to um, offer one of its uh, formal lectures. The Academy has a number of endowed lecture series which are offered on a regular basis and regarded as a, a very distinguished invitation to offer. And this particular series, the Aspects of Art series, has been going for nearly a century. It was first offered in 1916, and we'll have to think about an appropriate way of celebrating it when uh, the centenary year uh, comes round. And the lecture is uh, to be delivered on uh, any aspect of art in any of its manifestations. And uh, we're delighted uh, this evening to be having it here in Edinburgh as part of Medieval Week with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Delighted, too, that um, a fellow of <coughs> the Royal Society of Edinburgh and of the British Academy is um, going to deliver it, uh, namely Professor Robert Hillenbrand, who is uh, an emeritus professor in the history of art at the University of Edinburgh, an honorary prof professorial fellow in the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies. He's the author of uh, many works and an authority on um, Islamic art and uh, architecture with particular reference to um, Iran and Syria. And his topic tonight, I think I may have just have nudged his slide, I'm sorry, uh, is, is uh, there we are, uh, The Past is Propaganda, the Mongol World History. Would you please welcome Professor Hillenbrand. <laughs> I'd like to begin by giving my heartfelt thanks to the Binks Trust for supporting the work that my wife and I are currently engaged in, in making this great manuscript uh, available to a wider audience. Uh, propaganda is a modern word recorded from 1842 onwards, and its expression in the modern world usually depend on the media of mass communication. Newspapers and radio, film and television and more recently, the Internet. The Nuremberg rallies helped Hitler to tighten his hold on Germany. Cassette tapes and fax machines were crucial to the rise to power of Khomeini and Yeltsin, respectively. But pre-modern societies were alert to the idea and uses of propaganda, even if they lacked the means uh, to spread it on a sufficiently grand scale five copies of the Declaration of Our Broth, or in a suitably nuanced way. Special occasions from festivals to funerals, and from coronations to triumphs, as well as religious rituals, parades, processions, all provided opportunities for propaganda in a general sense. But however grand a spectacle such occasions might offer, It was a temporary affair. It couldn't be recalled at will and studied more closely. The message had to be put across instantaneously and it had a short shelf life. In this situation, a ruling elite that wanted to deliver key messages to the population at large and to do so continuously had very few options at its disposal. In this lecture, I hope to show how the Mongol rulers of Iran in the 14th century tackled this problem in a strikingly original way and with some success. They went far beyond earlier attempts in this vein. For example, in early Islamic coins, which broke all previous precedent by using both sides of the coin to proclaim the Islamic creed and thus worked as religious propaganda aimed at the non-Muslim majority. The authorities also experimented with clothing festooned with inscriptions like sandwich men and sometimes working as a kind of livery. And some Islamic buildings bore hundreds of meters of inscriptions, both historical and Quranic. But each of these media was hampered by inbuilt constraints, which made them suitable for no more than very limited and simplified propaganda. Coins were too small. The messages on textiles were too hard to read. Monumental inscriptions were often located 
too high up or executed on too small a, a, a scale to be readily legible. And none of these forms of propaganda reached the illiterate. Let me present a work that solved some of these problems. The Edinburgh University Library possesses in the Jame Atawarikh, commonly known as the World History, datable 1314 and produced in Tabriz in northwest Iran, one of the supreme masterpieces of Persian book painting. Its extreme rarity, its huge size, its lavish illustration, and its very early date combine to give it a good claim to be the single most valuable illustrated Islamic manuscript in the world. Now this world history was produced at the command of Ghazan Khan, the Mongol ruler of Iran, who ordered his vizier, Rashid ad-Din, a Jewish doctor from Western Iran who converted to Islam and had already served successive uh, Mongol rulers as principal vizier, to write it. Though one wonders where he found time. I bet it was ghosted. <laughs> the work represents an intellectual enterprise of the first order and one unique in the history of the medieval world, covering as it does in its original four volumes, though no complete manuscript has survived, China and India, Mongolia, most of the Islamic world, Tibet, which is what you see here, Russia and Europe as far west as Ireland. Native informants, supplemented by earlier chronicles, provided the raw material for its 2,000 elephant folios, by far the largest illustrated text of Mongol times, of which the largest surviving portion is the 150 uh, folios of the Edinburgh manuscript. There's a smaller portion of the same copy, 59 folios long, in London. So 90% of the text is lost. That has some impact on my generalizations. The Edinburgh portion is of particular interest for several reasons. First, it contains much material from the Old and New Testaments, from the Apocrypha and the Midrash, all seen through Muslim eyes. Second, it contains the first coherent cycle of images of the Prophet Muhammad, images that had hitherto been taboo in the Islamic world. And third, its historical coverage is particularly full for the later Islamic period. The associated images, 70 in all, many of which are beautiful works of art, are full of echoes of Arab, Byzantine, Western and Chinese art. So, the manuscript stands at the crossroads of history and art history alike as the principal surviving illustrated document of the largest continuous land empire that the world has ever seen, stretching from Korea to East Germany and from the Sea of Japan to the Baltic. The multi-confessional flavor of text and images alike reflects these wide horizons when most of Asia was very briefly united under the Pax Mongolica. Let me move to the immediate context of the world history in its own time and place. Ghazan Khan, the young, energetic and far-sighted ruler of the Ilkhanid realm, that is the Persian part of the Greater Mongol Empire, commissioned the work shortly before his death in 1304. This was no casual whim. It should be seen within the framework of a whole series of measures aimed at changing public perceptions of the Mongols, which were not positive, <laughs> and fostering their acculturation into Perso-Islamic society. Ghazan felt that it was time to shed the image of the Mongols as an alien and ruthless conquering force and to strengthen their long-term commitment to the land that they were now ruling. To achieve such aims called for concessions on the part of rulers and ruled alike. And more than that, a fundamental change of attitude on both sides. The moving spirit behind this impetus for change was the young ruler himself, 
who shortly after acceding to the throne in 1295 took the epoch-making decision to embrace Islam. And happily, the entire Mongol elite felt the same way. In quick succession, he promulgated edicts that a mosque and a hammam should be built in every village in the country, with the mosque being paid for by the revenues of the hammam, and he instituted a savage persecution of Buddhist uh, temples and uh, other artifacts, although he'd been raised as a Buddhist. And here we see it being depicted in a contemporary manuscript, also in Edinburgh. He led this revival of Islamic piety by his own personal example, paying visits to key Iraqi shrines and refurbishing them generously. He himself could be described as an intellectual with a working knowledge of many fields of study, including natural history, medicine, chemistry, and astronomy. And he is credited with knowledge of a remarkable series of languages that spanned most of the territories of the Mongol Empire. Chinese, Mongolian, Tibetan, Kashmiri, Hindi, Persian, Arabic, and Frankish. It's unclear whether the last of these was French or Latin. He probably had some uh, basic Swahili as well. <laughs> he was an acknowledged expert in the history of his own people, and indeed Rashid ad-Din specifically notes that he received much of the information for the first volume of the history, namely the one devoted to the Mongols, from Ghazan himself. The extensive panorama of history and geography evoked by our manuscript certainly owes much to the vision, to the vaulting ambition of this remarkable monarch. So much for background. I want to argue in this paper that among the many departures which the world history of Rashid ad-Din represents, there was a propaganda dimension. It was almost unprecedented for Islamic manuscripts to function in this way. I say almost because from the outset, presentation Qur'ans of the utmost lavishness and magnificence of execution had been produced and dedicated to specified mosques for display purposes. Everything contributed to making a sumptuous visual impression which was appropriate to the word of God and to projecting not only the piety of those who had produced it, but also the authority of the Islamic faith itself. In that rather general and limited sense then, uh, luxury Qurans could be seen as a kind of religious propaganda. And the same, I suppose, could be said of luxury Hebrew Bibles, Gospel books, and Buddhist scriptures. With that exception then, manuscripts had not hitherto served propaganda purposes. And that's not strange. Think about it. And you can yourself suggest several reasons for this. Every manuscript, after all, is unique. And manuscripts are aimed at a very limited readership. Anyone who's read a book alongside an adult can testify just how uncomfortable that is. It's a private activity. Certainly public readings, often for purposes of dictation and therefore publication, were common in the medieval Islamic world, but those were for an academic audience, and erudition, not propaganda, was the aim. How then was the world history any different? Several answers suggest themselves. Let me enumerate them quickly before discussing them in more detail. First, they were copied en masse. Second, they were intended for free public display. Third, they were exceptionally large. Fourth, their content was truly global in reach. Fifth, they were lavishly illustrated with big paintings, some of them even with no text, like this one. And I hope to show that it's principally through the medium of these paintings 
that the propaganda dimension operated. First then, the issue of copying. The text was planned from the outset to be produced in multiple identical versions on as near an industrial scale as medieval production methods as well as the sheer scale and expense of the enterprise would permit. And although the reproduction of texts was a profit-oriented business in this society, no charge to users was levied, which suggests that something very unusual was going on here. Rashid Adin was neither the first nor the last politician to harbour literary ambitions. But it was a royal commission, not his own gross egotism, that inspired the entire mass copying project. These multiple copies were produced, as I say, free, every six months in the two literary languages of the Eastern Islamic world, Persian and Arabic. Rashid Adin's endowment deed stipulated that a copy should be sent, presumably in whatever language was appropriate, to the major cities of the Ilkhanid realm. That is, uh, an area whose fluctuating boundaries extended in this period from Syria in the west to the Black Sea and the Caucasus and Central Asia in the north and to the borders of Pakistan in the east. They were to be displayed so the deed runs, in mosques and madrasas. In other words, in public venues, a madrasa is a theological college. And they were to be made available to all comers. So no specific class of readers was identified. And the prevalence of numerous illustrations meant that the manuscripts could reach even the illiterate. The decision to target the major cities meant that in fairly short order, let's say 10 years, the majority of the urban population under Ilkhanid, that's Western Mongol rule, could have had access to these manuscripts. And in the longer term, most city dwellers in the whole realm. I think you can deduce that there was never any intention to reach people who lived in villages. So much then for the theme of mass copying and gratis display and for the destination of these copies. A third factor which distinguishes uh, the world history from earlier secular manuscripts is quite simply its huge size. In their present severely trimmed state, little more remains of the original page than the multi-framed text block which includes illustrations and that measures 36 by 25 centimetres. That was unprecedented at the time. But it gives a misleading impression of the original size of the manuscript. For the aesthetic of the time, let's look at our Quran again, dictated that the text block should be set within very substantial upper, lower and outer margins so that the reader's attention would immediately focus on it. The desired effect would be akin to displaying a jewel against a broad expanse of black velvet. To isolate it, to set it off to best advantage. The original size would have been at least 50 by 37 centimeters per page and it might have been a full third more than that. So that when the bound manuscript was open at a double page spread, it probably measured something like one and a half meters across and the best part of a meter high. This then was even larger than the elephant folio, which is the largest standard size in Western book production. This book was cumbersome, hernia inducing, <laughs> quite unsuited to ordinary reading and it required a lectern or some similar raised support if it was to be to see regular use. Here are examples of another uh, version of Rashid Adin's work and you can see how it's been trimmed uh, to within an inch of its life. Fourthly, the world history broke new ground in its content, which was nothing short of revolutionary. That content, moreover, 
responded to uh, Mongol experiences, needs, and ambitions, rather than recycling the familiar uh, formulae of Islamic universal histories, with their quite unselfconscious bias to what happened in the Muslim world. The rest of the world didn't count. And in the same way, 13th century Western universal histories are Eurocentric. Rashid ad dins world history, by contrast, lives up to his name. He was well informed about China, and he knew, do you, that there were no snakes in Ireland. <laughs> his is by far the most comprehensive history written anywhere in the pre-modern world. And that makes it an astonishing achievement. There's no intention here to claim that it, the coverage was balanced or complete. Indeed, the decision to devote one entire volume out of a total of four to the history of the Mongols, whose history is that short, suggests spin. To eke out its exiguous material into a complete volume implied a corresponding reduction in the other three volumes of the history. And to put the history of the Mongols first in pole position as the umbrella under which the rest of the world's history could unfold is also a move fraught with political significance. It underlines the paramount nature of Mongol rule in the contemporary world. And further, it seeks to project that paramount status back into the past and thereby to rewrite history. The sheer size of the enterprise, the sheer scope, remains unprecedented. Surviving portions treat the history of China. The, the top picture here is the grove in which the Buddha found enlightenment. And the one below is of uh, Moses' coffin, it looks like floating down the placid Nile or going down Niagara Falls it's hard to tell but the history of the Jews as the history of China of India, of the Turks, of the Franks there's nothing missing this interest in the wider world reflects the direct personal experience which the Mongols had accumulated about the vast Eurasian world and their desire to get to know their new uh, dominions, as well as the areas adjoining them, which were ripe for con conquest. So Rashid ad dins world history is an outgrowth from, and a testament to, uh, that great empire. And without needing to drive the point home, the structure of the work reminds the readers of the size of that empire. The various subsections could indeed be seen as an attempt to stake a Mongol claim to past cultures, no matter whether those were Arab and Persian, Jewish, Christian, Indian, Chinese, Turkish, Frankish, all grist to the mill. And here, the unity of style and presentation in the illustrations could play its part, especially in all details of military type, which are presented in an instantly recognizable and exclusively Mongol idiom. So whatever the historical or geographical context, Mongols are everywhere and they dominate the past. It's a big lie. But it's the biggest lies that work best. The fifth unusual aspect of the world history was the significant role allotted to illustration, even though the content of those illustrations was strikingly repetitive and limited. In the Edinburgh manuscript, there are 70 illustrations unevenly divided among 150 folios, so something like an average of one, fo one illustration for every two folios or so. This means that the paintings were not merely supplementary, as it were random grace notes for the text, but were intended from the outset to be integrated with it 
so that the pictures and the narrative are interdependent or alternatively tell different stories. Moreover, the huge size of the page meant that the illustrations, even though for the most part they took the form of a narrow strip, as you see here, extending for the full width of the text block, would still have a substantial painted surface. They were thus capable of accommodating quite complex compositions. This increased size of the paintings made it possible for several people at once to read the text simultaneously, just as uh, and the same thing applies, obviously, to the illustrations. Studying this manuscript in some provincial city could therefore become a group activity and could be expected to generate discussion and debate, if not exactly a seminar. At all events, it opened the door to a primitive kind of propaganda. The scope of that propaganda was, I repeat, constrained, not least by the need to make text and image reflect each other, if at slightly predictable intervals. So it wasn't an option for the painters to develop themes for which the text gave them no warrant. The desire to use the images for propaganda purposes, or at any rate, to carry a message, this is Alexander the Great, over and above the requirements of illustrating a given event in the narrative, involved whoever was responsible for choosing the subjects for illustration, let's call him the project manager, in concentrating the visual material into a few themes. You've already seen this. Repetition, after all, was a key element in the success of this strategy. The opportunity cost of reducing the subject matter of the illustrations in this way was to renounce the option of using the, the paintings to develop the full richness of the text. And so we have many unique and fascinating events left unillustrated. And there's another factor at work, the perennial demand for speed to meet unforgiving production deadlines that were a necessary part of the whole enterprise. Imagine being one of these painters. Good grief. It's Thursday and I've got to do four of these paintings by next Friday at 12, otherwise I'll be out on my neck. And so they start repeating each, repeating themselves. The, the grouping of the figures is a good example. And concentrating the illustrations on themes that have a propaganda dimension means that the limited range of subject matter could be, uh, could be made to, to fit a much, more, uh, a much tighter timescale than was the norm in illustrated manuscripts. So speed of execution and political propaganda went hand in hand, the one reinforcing the other. But enough of history, enough of context, uh, it's time to look more closely at the illustrations and at what they say. I'll confine my remarks to the Edinburgh portion of the manuscript, and I propose to deal with three major themes as expressed in these illustrations. Those can be defined briefly as violence, authority, and piety. Each of them carries a simple message that requires no literacy at all to understand that is, moreover, driven home by sheer repetition. The cumulative effect of a succession of related images is not to be underestimated. All that the viewer has to do is to turn the pages and the message gradually punches home. In this context, it's worth remembering that the world history was not one volume but four, all of them separately displayed. So a good many people in a big room could look at these manuscripts simultaneously. Now, I'm not trying to argue that these uh, three themes served exclusively propaganda purposes. Far from it. Each had its appropriate place within the general narrative.
And so, at a primary level, it functioned as a specific illustration of a specific episode. But there was also a generic level to these images. They contributed to what might be termed the hidden agenda of this great government-generated project. It's of the nature of symbols to speak with more than one voice. That's why we use them. The illustrations encompassed by the three themes of violence, authority, and piety are multivalent. They comment on the narrative, they make the book more interesting and visually impressive, and over and above this, many of them convey a political message. It's that latter symbolic or propaganda dis dimension of these paintings that helps to account for what would otherwise be very puzzling in this richly funded project, that the themes expressed in these illustrations are so very limited. In, in theory, the range of subject matter is endless. In practice, it's tiny. The stress on violence and on authority, in particular, trumps everything else, as if history were no more than this. Let's consider these themes, these, these themes more closely, bearing in mind that some overlap occurs, as when an image of authority, here's Moses, for instance, um, getting rid of Korah, who has uh, contested his leadership, that overlaps with violence and perhaps piety. There can be no doubt that the overriding visual impression of these paintings is that of an unremittingly violent and brutal world. Of the 70 paintings in the Edinburgh manuscript, 35, exactly half the total, deal with battles, sieges, punishment, and violent death. So far as its paintings are concerned, this is quite simply a book drenched in blood. That's an awesome and uncomfortable feeling. At one stage, there are 54 sides of richly illustrated text in which all the paintings, with two exceptions, are about violence. It does your head in. <laughs> Let me recall the lethal brevity of one Persian historian describing the Mongol conquest. Armadand, Kandand, Sohtand, Kushtand, Bardand, Raftand. They came, they uprooted, they burned, they slaughtered, they plundered, they departed. Let me begin with punishment and violent death. Even events of the distant past are given a raw contemporary edge, as in the Mongol cat catapult that precipitates Abraham into the furnace. Rustam's compound Mongol bow, whose arrow pins a traitor to the tree. Or the bloody shambles, as Samson, in a turban if you please, brings down the temple of Dagon. Where the corpses heaped high would revive memories of the Mongol holocaust among older viewers. Other unfortunates are drowned this is an unscheduled crossing of the Red Sea below or swallowed up as we've seen in earthquakes. Cowering captives are unceremoniously hauled by their beards towards a blazing fire. Kneeling prisoners await the executioner's sword. And St. George, top, already tortured, is pulled half naked before the king with a chain round his neck. Courtiers look on impassively as a wretch in the stocks, his teeth bared, watches his arm being methodically amputated while another victim 
thrashes wildly on the floor while the executioner kneels on the small of his back, yanking up his head and cutting his throat. In almost every case, an enthroned monarch calmly presides over the bloodshed, whether actual or imminent. Each of these scenes depicts an episode in the text, but running through them all is an unmistakable moral for every viewer to draw. It doesn't pay to alienate the monarch. Bad things happen if you do. Collectively, these images of punishment encourage unquestioning submission to the ruling authority. All the other violent images have to do with battle, either actual or imminent, apart from four which depict sieges. All these paintings, as I've said earlier, have an instantly recognizable Mongol air. This extends well beyond facial characteristics to embrace headgear, clothing, footwear, armor, weapons, equipment, even their mounts are the hardy Mongol ponies. Yet these scenes depict events that predate the Mongol eruptions into Iran. And these earlier paintings, uh, earlier paintings that are not in this, for instance, found in other manuscripts, found on um, painted pottery, for example, don't have this visual language at all. So what we see here is a deliberate change of policy and a decision to depict the scenes in Mongol guise as the default mode for the whole manuscript. To Iranians, traumatized over a period of three generations by invasions, sieges, and massacres at the hands of Mongol hordes, and currently enduring government by an alien Mongol elite. This presentation of the past, including their own past, embodied in Mongol form, would have operated as a kind of brainwashing. And the concomitant emphasis on violence and bloodshed, you can, you can hear the thud as the mace make, makes contact there, can't you? Could scarcely fail to recall the havoc wrought by soldiers looking just like these on their own ancestors. These scenes of conflict then, like those of punishment, would have had a menacing, if subliminal, subtext of retribution that awaited any rebellion against Mongol rule. These threatening images, their impact intensified by relentless repetition, glorify brute force. That force has a Mongol face, and it's found in a book produced by government edict in multiple copies. As one leaves through the pages, one realizes that in simplistic terms, it presents history as being about war and the pity of war. But there's little poetry in the pity. If this isn't propaganda, it's something very similar, and it is plainly repressive in intent. The second major theme, authority, is also expressed in a consistent and notably repetitive way. The pictorial language is spare and formulaic. The focus of the image is always the ruler himself, surrounded by empty space and isolated on a throne that usually floats above the ground line and is furnished with bolster and footstool. It raises him above his surrounding bodyguards and courtiers, most of whom are marked out as Mongols by their headgear. You'll see again that grouping in twos, threes, and fours, usually on either side of him, and that underlines both their subordinate status and their lack of individuality. The body language of inclined heads, eyes cast down or fixed attentively on their lord and master, of crossed hands, of arms held straight across the chest or gripped by the other hand. All of this speaks of disciplined obedience. He alone is seated in comfort 
and ostentatious, ostentatious magnificence. They, on the other hand, stand, kneel, or sit on simple low stools. So clear visual distinctions operate to ensure that the ruler takes pride of place. His throne usually has elements of bright scarlet, a tone that suggests Chinese lacquer work. And indeed, uh, these are IKEA uh, do-it-yourself thr thrones. <laughs> the lobed outlines, foliate feet and dragon finials, as well as the imbricated uh, waves of the upholstery and the use of uh, Chinese flowers like lotus, uh, chrysanthemum, peony in the upholstery, all of this is part of the Chinese character of these fittings. The reference to the East Asian ref uh, origins of the Mongols, even when the people concerned are not Mongols at all, is unmissable. The ruler's chest often uh, carries a Mandarin square of Chinese type. So the accumulation of these details excludes any possibility of identifying the monarch as a Persian. Instead, they present him as East Asian and therefore stress his remoteness from his Persian subjects. And this is also true of images of pre-Islamic Persian shahs. They too bear that same East Asian character. Here too, the attendants are obviously Mongol in appearance and dress. And yet, these are all the heroic kings of the Iranian past, and even the greatest of national heroes, Rustam, with that RAF moustache, <laughs> waxed to within an inch of its life, uh, even he turns up, but is presented in Mongol guise. So even when lip service is paid to that most Persian of Persian books, the Book of Kings, it is seen through a Mongol lens. The general exception to this uh, Far Eastern ambiance is the presence of Persian officials, an acknowledgement of their crucial role in the government, for without them, from Rashid Adin himself downwards, the government would not have operated. They're usually seated, sometimes engaged in taking down notes or dictation, and their dress, for example, the use of a turban, distinguishes them from the Mongol courtiers. Occasionally, the ethnic differences are stressed, as in the case of this egghead, trying vainly to get the attention of the ruler. From time to time, an air of informality sidles into these stereotypical icons of kingship. Once, for example, the monarch is attended by a falconer, holding a raptor, or he takes a cup from a salver proffered by a kneeling servant, while behind the servant, a lady with hennaed hands strums her harp. But for the most part, the atmosphere is formal and serious, though it's significantly more relaxed and lifelike than the standard royal enthronement of 13th century date with its unblinking frontality. So the seated pose you'll see in these examples is redolent of comfort rather than stateliness, with one leg stretched out, dangling, or tucked in. Meanwhile, the ruler consistently engages in some kind of contact with those around him, tilting his head, leaning forward, or making actual eye content. Only once is he depicted in formal audience mode, looking blandly outward, top one, with seated courtiers ranged in groups on either side, like a council in session. He always wears a version of the so-called Seljuk or tricorn crown, and above the scene there hovers uh, a swathe of material printed out with loops and ribbons and uh, embroidery, possibly representing a rolled up curtain, a canopy, or even a tent. The curiosity here is the crass 
misunderstanding of the ancient pre-Islamic uh, Persian tradition of the hanging crown to indicate uh, the absent king. Here, in the image of a Seljuk monarch who is already crowned, it floats uncomfortably and redundantly above him. If the scenes of battle and violence transmit alongside and so to speak beneath their immediate narrative raison d'etre, a sense of the raw terror generated by the Mongols, the 19 enthronement scenes, which account for more than 27% of the paintings in the Edinburgh manuscript, present a different image, an image of spare, solemn, dignified grandeur. The ruler whose person, whose, whose person and ambiance are distinctively East Asian in appearance carries such appurtenances of kingship as uh, crown, throne, canopy, likely, but his authority is unassailable, and he presides over a largely Mongol court in which Persian officials are demoted to a lowly and distinctly unmilitary role. The Mongol courtiers carry weapons, bows, swords, maces, but the Iranians never do. The subliminal propagandist message here seems to be that the future of Iran like its past, is in the hands of non-Iranians and is set to continue that way. Might is right. But the ruler is presented as a man who, while he is touched by the charisma of kingship and is capable of inflicting fearsome punishment, nevertheless also interacts with those at his court and listens to his counsellors. I come now to my third theme, public piety. Here too the images, ten in all, are concentrated in a single section of the text which extends for 32 sides. These are images of Muhammad. Now one of the major alienating factors of the Mongol invasion was that they were not only sudden, calamitous and of unexampled ferocity, but that the invaders weren't Muslims and showed no respect for or understanding of the Islamic faith. Chinggis Khan famously stabled his horses in the great mosque of Bukhara. His men came, as it were, from Mars. And that, of course, made them still more terrifying. And when the Mongols did establish themselves as rulers of Iran, their religious practices did not endear them to their subjects. They themselves were animists or Buddhists, and they promoted Jews and Christians to high-ranking positions in the government in the face of Muslim resentment. All this could not fail to drive a wedge between rulers and ruled. And the conversion of Ghazan, the supreme ruler, and with him the Mongol elite in 1295 that I've spoken of, changed all this. One of several interpretations of that epoch-making uh, event is that it was intended as an olive branch offered by the Mongols to their subjects. But that doesn't mean that the Mongols quickly familiarized themselves with a religion that had 700 years of complex and turbulent development in Iran already. Take the Mongol ruler Ul Jaitu, who reigned between 1304 to 17, who was by turns, listen to this, a Christian, an animist, a Buddhist, a Sunni Muslim, a Shiite Muslim, and eventually, perhaps to be on the safe side, ended his days as a Sunni, reflects this unease with traditional Islamic norms. And it was this Islamic vicar of Bray who was on the throne when our manuscript was copied. Now what light does this situation uh, shed on the cycle of paintings that illustrate the, the life of Muhammad? These images are not only the most detailed visual account of Muhammad's life that had been produced within the Islamic world for some 700 years, they're also almost the first account. The very first account is in another manuscript, also in Edinburgh, from two years earlier than this. Put plainly, the Mongols shattered a powerful and very long-standing taboo in creating these pictures. I've shown that particular picture to many an Arab dignitary, 
and an instant response is, oh, but that's done by Persians. Not possible that a Muslim could have done this, and yet the text is in Arabic. It was precisely Mongol ignorance of or indifference to Muslim norms that made these extraordinary pictures possible. Are they teaching aids for newly converted Mongols? Are they intended in a purely historical spirit rather than a theological one? It's a history book after all. Or is the Mongol experience of Christianity and Buddhism, both of them faiths with a long tradition of religious images, did that lead naturally to a demand for similar images to this new faith which the Mongols had been told to adopt? Any of these are possible. But one might also consider these unprecedented images, some of which recycled such Christian themes as the Annunciation or the Baptism or the Nativity as a very public profession of the Mongols' commitment to their new faith. That the means that they chose for this purpose was guaranteed to offend Muslims is a most unfortunate irony. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't an intention to build a bridge. And there can be no question that part of the aim of these images, which, as you can see, owe so much to Christian images of a very different kind, part of the aim of these images was to venerate Muhammad. Hence the frequent presence of angels. There they are holding uh, the baby Muhammad in uh, an Islamic nativity. And that is a clear sign that he enjoys God's favor. So part of the official strategy behind the world history may well have been to win over hearts and minds of as many Persians as possible though the means chosen were questionable. It's time to conclude. I began this lecture by looking briefly at the ways in which, from early Islamic times, Muslim rulers had experimented with various forms of propaganda that had a longer-term effect than, say, uh, special displays on one-off occasions. The decision to use huge books in multiple copies and in two languages and to illustrate them with uh, a whole mass of uh, pictures is an impressive example of lateral thinking. At a stroke, it propelled the illustrated book from the private to the public realm. The premier target, no doubt, was an educated provincial audience, the intelligentsia and opinion makers across the land. But crucially, the project also catered for a simpler and illiterate audience and used the big illustrations in these big manuscripts as a means to that end. The themes that I've talked about, violence, authority, piety, and the pictures that express them, speak with various voices. Some go for the jugular and are frankly terrifying. Others seek to persuade. So there's both a carrot and a stick. And these three themes account for the vast majority, 87%, of the paintings in the Edinburgh Manuscript. That in itself is food for thought. Quite apart from the overall project of presenting history through a Mongol lens, the intention was probably to send several messages at once. The irresistible might of the Mongol war machine, the permanent nature of Mongol power, the Mongol commitment to acculturation, not one of these messages gets in the way of the others. And they all work, both because they're simple and because they're frequently repeated. So between them, the Mongol ruler and his Judeo-Muslim vizier had dreamed up a radically new use for manuscript illustration. Their gigantic picture book served, among other purposes, as a flexible vehicle for quite sophisticated propaganda. And given that this was an age that had no concept of newspapers or radio, 
television or the internet, that is an achievement worth saluting. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm aware that uh, a reception awaits us all, um, so perhaps we'll uh, restrict ourselves to a, 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 selection, a small selection of questions to Professor Hillenbrand, and then we'll uh, proceed to the reception. Does anyone want to start with a question? By an underground method in the per, in the aftermath of the Indian Mutiny, a, uh, a Scottish soldier made some kind of deal with the Nawab of Oud, um, which he did not commit to paper. But what he did commit to paper was uh, a legal deed of such tightness that when the university tried to get rid of this manuscript in the course of um, uh, a serious financial uh, disaster in 1990, it found that it couldn't get its sticky fingers onto the manuscript at all. <laughs> Habent sua fata libelli. <laughs> yes, what, here. There's a microphone. Uh, my, my memory is that Genghis Khan had uh, thought he had a divine commission to conquer the world. I noticed that, you, that, that there were three different elements of the propaganda you said were quite separate in a sense. Is there any sense in which the divine piety is linked to the violence so that it's, no. it's seen as a, a divine no, no, not, blessing? No, not, not at all. You're, you're right about Chinggis Khan. One sky over mankind, one ruler over the earth. Uh, that's, that's the motto. But the religion that is uh, referred to in these illustrations is always the Muslim religion, and it's only in that small section. So, no, there's, there's, there's no concept that the Mongols themselves had any religious belief at all. In reference to your uh, remarks at the start of the paper about uh, the inscriptions on buildings and the visual imagery in the presentation which followed, I was wondering how much bearing um, spoken tradition and oral culture would have had upon the dissemination of these sources and upon the, the inscriptions at the start of the presentation. The uh, oral tradition of the Mongols was of surpassing interest to the Mongols and of zero interest to the Persians. So I don't think there was any question of uh, a, an oral transmission of the content of the world history. In fact, it was a step away from the, from the whole issue of orality. And I think what's, what's been underplayed in accounts of this manuscript is the importance of the illustration, which I think is, is largely about an attempt to appeal to the illiterate. But have I asked your, answered your question? Well, the reason I raise it is because um, it reminds me of parallels, at least what, what it reminds me of is um, Anglo-Saxon and Celtic art uh, in stonework with inscriptions at a time when levels of literacy would have been very low, and yet one of the explanations which has been provided recently uh, is that such inscriptions would have been read and understood to those who did not understand them or who were illiterate from the buildings. So really the, the question rests upon the, the buildings and the monuments that you, you had at the start of the presentation. I, th I think in the days before telephoto lenses, we have to accept that many of these inscriptions were intended for a divine readership. <laughs> no other option. Uh, or for someone who was an extremely able epigrapher. And uh, it's interesting to have the experience of lecturing on early Qurans in the Gulf to native Arabs. And they say, how can you read that stuff? We can't. So. I, th I think there's, an, there's an, an element in which the inscriptions have a quasi-magical form.
false. Uh, the minaret that I showed you doesn't just have that blue inscription. Its entire body is encircled by uh, Surah 19 of the Quran, Surah Maryam, which is the Surah used for conversion purposes. And uh, you have to be a magician to be able to read it as it snakes its way up a 200-foot minaret, I beg for you. Let's take, one, let's take one more. Thank you. Um, can you judge from the amount of bar in the manuscript uh, as to how often it was, in fact, on public display? It's, um, it's very distressed. Uh, when you look at it in, uh, in close-up, uh, under an electron microscope, for example, or even under, under very strong magnification, uh, its, uh, its fibers are broken. It has been used and reused and reused and reused and remargined and remargined. Uh, so, yes, it's, it's seen very, very heavy wear at some stage. But in 1857, it was in a princely um, uh, collection where most of its uh, readers were woodworm. <laughs> so it had a different later, later fate from its 14th century fate. I think we'd better draw the discussion to a, to a close. Uh, could I ask Get me you afterwards. To, uh, to thank Professor Hindlebrand for his, for his lecture tonight. And I, I'd just like to say from the British Academy how, again, how uh, greatly pleased we've been to be able to uh, present Medieval Week here in Edinburgh in partnership with the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And I'd like to call on the President of the Royal Society, Lord Wilson, just to close our proceedings. Thank you very much. I don't want to delay people from the reception any longer. I simply would like to say thank you to the British Academy for Medieval Week. Um, it may be that at a time of budget cuts and things like that, that a medieval week is a form of escapism. And it's really rather nice to go into a medieval world. But quite apart from that, it, it's been a fascinating week. It really has been tremendous. We in the Royal Society of Edinburgh are enormously pleased that you have brought this week here and, and with it such distinguished lecturers and, and lectures. It's been a tremendous week. Thank you, the audience, too, for coming and providing a enormously well-informed audience. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as certainly I have, and I'm not going to delay you any longer from a reception which is upstairs. Thank you. Thank you.